Uh, my name is Jerry Root, and I teach here in Christian formation and ministry and in evangelism. And I also work with the um, Institute for Strategic Evangelism. And could please come in. And we um, thought that maybe we could provide a service for students before summer, because all of you will be in contact with different people who don't know Christ yet. And God may use you as a link to lead them to Jesus. So we thought maybe we could talk about that a little bit this evening and then take some time for Q&A. So we'll probably go about 50 minutes and our discussion take some time for Q&A. We'll be out of here by 9 o'clock. And um, before I do this, um, I, I just want to share uh, something. I'm not a connoisseur of methods of sharing your faith. Uh, if you have a method that you like to use, I think you should use it. There, ev everything that I've ever seen people use to share their faith that I didn't like, I've seen somebody use it well. And I've learned from that, you know, uh, to have the attitude that the Apostle Paul had in Philippians chapter 1, where he said, you know, some are preaching Christ from good motives, some for bad. I just say if Christ is preached, I rejoice. This is a much kinder, gentler Paul than we had met earlier in the book of Acts, you see. So I would like to share with you, though, out of a lifetime since I became a Christian as a freshman in college, of things that I've learned about sharing your faith that maybe will be encouraging for you and helpful for you. Um, how many of you have uh, shared your faith before in the past? So most of you have some experience. So we'll see if we can feed into that experience and we can, we'll see if we can help alleviate any of the fears. Some of you sometimes have fear about it. Okay, we'll see if we can alleviate some of the fear. All right, so let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I worship you for the privilege of being with these students this evening, fully aware that if some of the things that we talk about are applied, as a result of our meeting here tonight, there will be people in heaven forever. There will be people whose experience on this life will be better because they will know you. They will know how deeply they are loved by you. They'll know they're forgiven. They will discover resources in the power of your Holy Spirit, not to necessarily live a better life, but when things are frustrating, they'll have the resource to not respond with bitterness or anger, how to turn the other cheek, how to love even those who do not love them, how to say, as your son said, before those who crucified him, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Lord, we want the full extent of all the graces that you have to offer us. The hope of eternal life, the joy of being reconciled to the Father, the hope of knowing that we could live purposeful lives now. These things, Father, we not only want to experience ourselves, but we desire others to see um, that kind of love and forgiveness in their life too. So give us grace to that end, I pray, and I thank you for Christ's sake. Amen. We, we don't share Jesus in order to swell the roles of the church. We don't share Jesus in order to get more giving units in the church. We share Jesus for this reason. We're so overwhelmed by his love and his forgiveness that we think others would want to know that they're loved and forgiven like he's uh, loved us and forgiven us. And I don't know any person who's lived one moment of honest life who doesn't realize that they need to be forgiven. And I don't know one person who's lived one moment of honest life who as appreciative as he or she may be of human love still knows that human love often is fickle, often demands meriting, and longs to be loved unconditionally with the love that God has for us. Our motive for telling people about Jesus is that they could know that they're loved and forgiven. I think that's the greatest apologetic to the faith. Greater than any of the answers, philosophical answers, as important and great as those are. So with that in mind, um, I would like to suggest to you that we don't take, uh, did you get notes? Did you all get the notes? Okay, because um, there are notes up here. Um, we don't take Jesus to anybody. He's already there. 
He's more interested in that other person than you or I will ever be. We go to make explicit what he might be doing already implicitly in their hearts as he woos people to himself. And I think there are often points of connection whereby the gospel can be presented naturally and winsomely. If we seek to understand God and his ways with us, it will make us more sensitive to discern his ways with others. Um, Jesus met people where they were. And he looked for points of connection. There was a guy named Baron von Hugel. I got to this author through C.S. Lewis. Uh, Lewis would often refer to him. He was a spiritual director to Evelyn Underhill, if you know that name. He was a philosopher of religion. And in his letters to his niece, which are themselves models of spiritual direction, he said to her, I want to make the most of whatever light people have got, however slight it may be, to strengthen and deepen what they already possess if I can. In that same letter, he went on to say, Our Lord tells us not to put out the smoking flax, not to break the bruised reed, and yet I always see this. God makes lovely little flowers to grow everywhere, but someone always comes and sits on them. He wants us to work with what we find when we encounter a person. That means we're going to have to ask some questions along the way. We're going to have to do some serious listening. And we're going to have to respond thoughtfully to the responses that we get. Because every response we get from another person when we ask a question comes with permission to ask more deeply. I'll talk more about that in a moment. We want to seek to connect with people where they are in any given moment or setting. Pray for God to open your eyes and your ears. I believe nothing connects uh, the integration of our liberal arts experience more than this fact, that all the stuff you've been learning in your gen eds make you able to connect with other people more widely and more deeply. I went to a secular college. And still to this day, I feel like my gen eds were the best part of my secular education. Because as I learned about psychology, as I learned about sociology, as I learned about some of the sciences, as I learned about history and literature, um, I found that each of these things gave me connection points. And I hope that you'll come to value your gen eds even more as you see one of the outcomes is that it makes you more efficient connecting with others as you seek to share the gospel with them. So as we see in Christ's life, he commented on public things. What did people have in common? So with Nicodemus in John 3, there was a theological question. But also note uh, Jesus' use of metaphors and, and, and figures of speech. The word definition means of the finite. We define things by their limitation and their function. To define anything, it has to be small enough for us to wrap words around it and, and uh, connect it with other things. We can define the podium because of its limitation, from the chair, from the backpack, and so on. How do you define God? If he's infinite, then it seems to me he breaks a category. So Jesus uses metaphors and similes. The kingdom of heaven is like. Uh, he uses figures of speech, parable. Sometimes we can connect the gospel through metaphor, and Jesus shows us that. He talks to Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes and says, We know you're a teacher uh, sent from God because of the things you do. And Jesus says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And that causes all kinds of disequilibrium, which all you people in your social science work know that disequilibrium is an important first step if you're going to move on to more knowledge in your field. Um, with the woman at the well, there was water. In asking for water, Jesus stepped outside of cultural conventions and awakened in the woman curiosities that led to deeper heart issues. O obviously, he had the advantage of being omniscient, so that helps a little bit. But nevertheless, he still models for us some things that we can do. Um, break out of the conventions. I don't know about you, but I I'm not good at directions. My wife has a built-in GPS. But I can get lost going home. I have to call up and find out how to get home each day just about. Whenever I need directions and I'm in a street corner or something, there's people around, I always look for the person who would be least likely to be asked. The guy in the wheelchair, the homeless guy, whatever. And ask them for directions. Cross those barriers and, and go out and put yourself at their uh, uh, 
uh, put yourself in a place of need before them, and so on. Jesus seemed to do that with the woman at the well. With the sick man at the pool of Bethesda in John 5, there was sickness, and a pool whose rumors and traditions enslaved, any, uh, enslaved many with raised expectations and crashing disappointments. And we live in a world where people have had raised expectations and crashed disappointments, and how can we connect the gospel with those deep felt needs? With each and every encounter Jesus had in a one-on-one -on -one situation, as it's recorded for us in scriptures, we have something that we can learn. And so we watch these. What is there available with which you can begin a conversation with another person? Um, at a bookstore, there's books. We see people looking around on a shelf, and you say, have you read anything lately, or what are you looking for? And begin to talk. You'll be surprised how quickly that conversation can go. We'll talk more about uh, taking the conversation deeper in a moment, but you start with books. Plots of books. The books they like. They, they like humanities. Do they like uh, uh, nonfiction? Um, whatever. And you begin with those kinds of discussions. After a movie, it's the plot or situations and how the characters responded to those situations. Did any of you see the play on campus, Doubt, that was playing this last week? Wasn't it fabulous? I've been to Broadway several times and seen plays. I've seen very good plays on Broadway. I don't think I've seen better than what I saw here in our own theater last week, but with the characters, how the different characters were responding to situations before them. These open up questions. After a movie, here's some questions you can ask. Which character did you identify with most and why? How many of you are going to be going home this summer? And the likelihood of you maybe going to a film with an old friend from high school um, is, is high. Go to the movie and say, hey, I, I'm going to do it on a condition that we go get a piece of pie afterwards so we could talk about the movie. And just ask these questions. What character did you identify most with and why? What did you find most admirable in the character you identified with? Which character did you find most irritating and why? You probably won't ask the questions like this, like you're giving them a take-home <laughs> exam. But you get the flavor of the kinds of things you can begin discussing. What were the unmet needs of the character you found most irritating? What did they want? And what did they not get? And what disappointments did they experience? And have you ever had periods of disappointment in your life? How did you work through those? And listen, listen, and let the person's answers take you to the place where the felt need is. Um, <clears throat> was the character going about getting what they wanted in a good way or a bad way? How do you make judgments as to what is good or bad? C.S. Lewis said all, all judgments imply a standard. What's the standard by which we make judgments? Is it self-referential? Or is there some objective standard? Were the needs of various characters good ones or bad ones? Were they fair? Was their attempt to fulfill their needs fair? Explain your answer. You know, it's one thing if you read a book and you can discuss it afterwards. But movies make these kinds of questions even more accessible more quickly. Because an hour and a half, two hour movie and you can be into the discussion. What do you think Jesus would do for this person if he is to meet those needs in a loving way? Also keep in mind, most filmmakers want a strong box, uh, a strong box office response. Consequently, they tell stories that touch the soul and speak deeply to embedded human themes intentionally. They're brilliant at it. For, my favorite movie is Forrest Gump. And, and I remember reading all these reviews, even in Christian uh, periodicals, trashing it as being postmodern, trashing it as being X and Y and Z. And I went to see the movie in England for the first time. And I came out of the theater, and the Brits were bawling. If you can make a movie that makes a straight-laced Brit ball, <laughs> somehow you've touched the heart. What did the movie makers know that we didn't know? What were they getting to? And, and I think that these filmmakers know. Uh, take a guy like James Cameron. He hates Christians. I've heard him interviewed many times. And yet, look at the movies he makes. Um, take Terminator 2. An alien from another world invades our world and gives up his life, saving a woman and a child. Next movie, he makes a Titanic. Spent more money on a film than had ever been spent in history. $200 million. As he's producing and directing that film and writing it, he's got all these financial backers he's accountable to. It better be successful. He makes a set 
a quarter the size of the original Titanic. He, he has Celine Dion and her ascendancy doing the music. Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio proven box office draws. But now he's got to tell a story. 2,200 people on the Titanic. It's 2,200 possible stories. But the story he gets is our story. Because you get this guy, Jack, who's assigned to the doomed ship and goes immediately to the bow of the ship and makes the shape of the cross and says, I'm king of the world. There's a woman stuck on that ship. She's stuck in circumstances not of her making. Her father has died. They've lived a pretty upper class life. But the mother knows they're broke and unless she marries her daughter off to somebody wealthy, she's not going to be able to take care of herself at the level she's used to. So what does she do? She pawns off her daughter to a jerk. And she's stuck in circumstances on this doomed ship. And she goes to the stern of the ship and she's going to jump off and Jack saves her life. They bring the old lady back to hear about this whole event. And she talks about how the night the ship goes down, how he saved her life and in some senses gives up his own in the process and drifts away. And when she tells the story, they say, we don't even have a record of him on the register. And she says, but isn't that amazing? He saved me in every way. Cameron knows this story works because it's so moving. Um, what's the next movie he makes? Avatar also spends $200 million making that movie. And it's about a guy who takes on the flesh of another world in order to go into that world to save that world. And, and what does the word avatar mean in Sanskrit? Incarnation. He is very deliberate about this. He knows this story works. Now, I don't know if he loves the story and is turned off at Christianity because he sees it portrayed poorly by Christians, or if he's a total manipulator and he knows that this story always works, so he uses it. The bottom line is sometimes we're ashamed of the story and we refuse to tell it or neglect to tell it. But here's a movie maker who knows it sells. And I don't know how many times you can get into films and see this sort of thing. Remember years ago, I saw Walt Disney's The Jungle Book. And I was an adult. I think we were watching it with my kids. And so you've got Baloo the bear and Bagheera the panther and they befriend Mowgli and Shere Khan the tiger wants to kill him. And there comes this moment at the end of the movie where Shere Khan goes to attack the boy and Baloo puts his life, his own body in harm's way. And it looks like the tigers killed him but a bolt of lightning comes and Shere Khan never comes back because he hates fire and so on. Bagheera the panther and Mowgli are walking away from the limp body of Baloo the bear looking back at him. And Bagheera says, Greater love hath no man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. I'm saying, that doesn't sound like Kipling to me. <laughs> I go rushing through my jungle book. I can't find it anywhere. I found it in John 15, of course. Somebody smuggled that thing in there. So years ago, I was asked to come and speak to the Disney artists. They would bring in somebody once a month to talk about story. And I had been invited to come in and talk about story from C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien's perspective. There were about 250, 300 artists in this tiered auditorium. And I was told, we know Lewis and Tolkien we're Christians. If it comes up in the narrative, that's okay, but this isn't a time to proselytize. You can ask her any question our artists ask, but we don't want you to abuse with this setting. I'm fine with that. I know if they go read Lewis and Tolkien, they're going to hear the gospel on most pages. So I talk about Lewis and Tolkien's theory of story and so on, and afterwards, artist raises his hand. Weren't Lewis and Tolkien Christians? Could you tell us about that? Next question, wasn't it Tolkien who had a hand in Lewis coming to faith? Could you tell us about that? Wasn't Aslan in the Narnian books a Christ figure? Could you tell us about that? When, when Gandalf gives up his life on the bridge, taking on the Balrog and saving the fellowship, wasn't there some Christ image in that whole sacrifice? 
And before you know it, for 45 minutes, every question that's been asked is a question like that. The artists saunter back to work. 20 artists come up. They look at me and they say, you're a Christian, aren't you? I said, yeah. And I realized these are the artists who have been asking the questions. I said, are you Christians? They said, of course. Why do you think we asked you those questions? <laughs> <clears throat> In an indirect way, they were trying to witness to their, to their fellow artists. So I said, okay, I have a question for you. And I asked him about the Jungle Book. And where did John 15 make its way into the Jungle Book? And they said, oh, we've had people here sneaking stuff in for years. <laughs> and then they said, and there are others here who sneak in other stuff as well. But nevertheless, if the films could sneak it in, what are the greatest novels ever written? I don't know how you even make that judgment. But I remember hearing Mortimer Adler, the great philosopher at University of Chicago, who started the great books tradition at University of Chicago, and who also was the editor-in-chief of the Encyclopedia Britannica, one of the few geniuses I've met in my life. I've heard him say that he thought the four greatest novels, from his impression, were um, Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov, War and Peace by um, um, uh, Tolstoy, Moby Dick by Herman Melville, and um, with Jean Valjean. <laughs> help me, help me, why, I'm having a brain freeze. <laughs> you know what, my, my ears are bad. Les Miserables, Les Miserables. <laughs> All four of them filled with redemptive themes. And people go to those books, why? Because if there's any story people want to know, it's true. It's this one. If there's any story people want to connect with, it's this one. And you, liberally educated, faith-integrated people, have access to that stuff at your fingertips. And you can use it for kingdom good. It's really cool. Okay, um, at Starbucks there's, or Caribou, there's coffee. How's it grown? The economics, the social justice issues that surround it, and so on. Now we're talking about Netflix, it's movies, seen anything good lately? Host a gathering to watch some TV series and discuss it afterwards. A walk in the park, you meet somebody, it's the weather, it's the dog being walked. I remember one time I went out with the YHM people, any of you going out with YHM? When they did their plunge in the city and we stayed overnight there and we did some evangelism discussion and we went out and I was at Hyde Park down by the University of Chicago. There was a little park there, there were four benches, and I saw a guy sitting on one of the benches. There was a bakery there, so I went over to the bakery and I bought two fritters. I don't need a fritter. I certainly don't need two. <laughs> but if you have two, you can offer one. And I went over to the bench where this guy's sitting, and I said, do you mind if I sit here? He was at one end of the bench, and he goes, free country. <laughs> I sit down. I reach in my bag to get a fritter, and. I said, you want a fritter? He said, no. I said, you know what, I, I bought two, I shouldn't have, look at me. I don't need two fritters. Really help me if you took the other one. He said, oh, all right. And he takes that fritter and I said, what's your name? He said, Bob. And we started a conversation. About 40 minutes into it, he was giving his heart to Jesus on that bench. He's there. We just started a conversation, do you live around here? He said, no, I actually live up in the city. Well, what brought you here, Bob? My mom and I had a big argument. He was probably a guy about 23. And I just needed to get away from home, and I came here, and I've just been sitting here. And it was through that that the conversation began to open up, and we started talking. On an airplane, it's travel. It's a pilgrim longing, or fear of travel. I'm a weird guy, man. I, I like turbulence on airplanes. You pay a lot of money to go to an amusement park, and I paid for the airline ticket, and I'm getting this as value added. <laughs> it's always interesting to me to see somebody white knuckling it on an airplane. I said, you get nervous when we start bouncing around like that? Yeah, tell me about that. You don't like to fly much? No, I hate it. Do you like to travel? Yeah, boom, we're into conversations. And. Um, at a funeral, it's death, it's missing loved ones. I remember my best friend's a guy named Tim Tremblay. He lives out in Santa Barbara. I was visiting him one day, just popped by his office, and 
He said, hey, Jerry, come on with me. I got to go to a funeral. That's just not my idea of a good time. <laughs> I said, OK, Tim, to be with you, I'll go. I didn't even know who the funeral, whose funeral it was. We go sitting in this pew, and I'm sitting next to this lady. After the funeral's over, I turned to her, and I said, did you know this person? She said, yeah. I said, it must have shaken you pretty badly that they died. And she said, yeah, because um, a few months ago, I was diagnosed with terminal cancer, and it's shaken me pretty hard. And I said, well, do you have hope for the future? Are you sure what will happen to you if you die? She said, no. I said, I'm Jerry. Her name was Pat. She just happened to know my best friend, you know, because she was his former secretary's mother that we would just happen to sit in that seat at that funeral with somebody already known to my best friend. Just a coincidence. Don't let it build your faith. <laughs> Every encounter is a God-ordained encounter. Matter of fact, you may think that you got nowhere in that conversation, but you don't know because there's somebody overarching and watching over all these encounters that we have. And we're, we're just soldiers in his army. And he gives the order, prompting of the Holy Spirit, talk to this person, and we follow the order. And I said, Pat, would you like to talk about it? There's a Starbucks over here, how about if we go? And she felt safe because she knew Tim. And we go to the Starbucks. And Pat gave her heart to Jesus in that Starbucks. And, and I'll introduce you to her one day. She died five months later. I'll introduce you to her one day. Is it cool or what? It doesn't always go well. You know, if, you, if you're afraid of striking out, don't play baseball. But if you never play baseball, you'll never know the joy of hitting a home run. And you don't know where you are in God's plan in that person's life. Some people, they don't come to Christ till after 15 encounters with somebody. And you might be at step number seven. And somebody else may be there at step 15 when they finally come to faith. Sometimes, if you do this with some degree of regularity, you'll hear back about this. I remember when I was in college, I was a wrestler. You have to take that completely by faith now. <laughs> And there was another guy on the team I led to Jesus our freshman year. I'd only been a Christian two months myself. And his name was Gary, and we ended up rooming together all through college. We went to seminary, and we roomed together until I got married. He stood with me in my wedding. And Gary and I would share Jesus with other people on the team. Our wrestling coach came to faith, even. And it was really interesting because he was, a, he was not a Christian, but his wife was a Christian, and she had been praying for him for years. And then to find out you were part of the answer of her prayer. And I, I, I think if you talk to somebody about Jesus, there's probably somebody in their life who's praying for them. And you can probably be going in the strength of those prayers. But there were these two guys, Ken and Joe. And they were uh, younger than us by two years. And we had shared Jesus with them, and they always gave us flack. I don't think there was a practice that went on where somewhere in the practice we didn't talk about Jesus. Somewhere. And it wasn't always that we brought it up either. They would bring it up because they wanted to rag us and stuff like that. I'm here at Wheaton College. A few years back, I get a phone call at my office. Jerry, this is a voice from your past. I said, yeah, who is it? He says, it's Joe. I said, Joe, did you ask Jesus in your heart yet? He said, I did. That's why I'm calling you. He said, I became a Christian two years after I graduated. He was two years younger than me, so it was four years since I had seen him. He got involved with Christian businessmen. He got discipled. He started leading people to Jesus. He started discipling them. He saw people he led to Jesus lead people to Jesus. He went to a Christian businessmen's meeting in Los Angeles, and somebody had said, there was somebody who was a link in your coming to faith who hasn't heard the end of the story. Find that person, call them, and tell them. He says, it took me three days to locate you. I just wanted to tell you that when you shared, it wasn't for naught. There is no bad outing for the gospel. Never. And if you go share Jesus and God gives you the prompting in your heart and you go talk to that person and it doesn't go well, don't worry about it. God knows what he's about. 
And if it goes well, go ahead and ask them if they wouldn't like to trust Christ right now. Or say, is there anything that would prevent you from trusting Christ right now? Um, we did that last uh, week ago Friday down in Chicago with the Chicago Evangelism team. A couple of students were talking with this person. I was sitting there. Finally, I went in and said, you know, the basic thing is that any person who's lived a moment of honest life knows they're messed up and knows they need to be forgiven. Any person who knows they've lived a moment of honest life knows they want to be loved with a love that's unconditional. Shared the gospel, said, is there any reason why you wouldn't want to trust Christ right now? And this guy, John, said no. And he prayed with us right there in the McDonald's down at Wrigleyville. It's not that hard. And just be sensitive to it. And I remember when I was a new Christian, I think I turned off some folks. Some guys in my fraternity, I was too aggressive with them. I wasn't as sensitive and so on. And they joined the fraternity and they said, we, we can't call you brother. And we don't see how you can call yourself a Christian. And I realized I needed to go back and set that right. Two years later, several of those guys I was able to lead to Jesus. Because I was able to hear their criticisms and try and change. And they saw me making the effort. I certainly didn't get it all together. And I certainly don't have it all together now. But even the fact that we could be honest and self-aware about the garbage in our life shows us there must be something that's enabling us to look honestly at life. And I would say the unconditional love of God and His forgiveness is the thing. And somehow it validates the message. Um, commenting on commonly shared and noted current events after 9-11. How many conversations did you have about spiritual things, deep things? After a plane crash, a school shooting, natural disasters, earthquakes in Haiti, tsunamis in Japan, mudslides along the Pacific coast, political incivilities and man's inhumanity to man. C.S. Lewis said, if our religion is something objective, then we must never avert our eyes from those elements in it which seem puzzling or repellent. For it's precisely in the puzzling or repellent where we discover what we do not yet know and need to know desperately. Engage in those conversations. If you don't know the answer, don't let the conversation end there. Say to them, you know what? The questions you're asking are intriguing to me. And I want to know the answer too. How about if we get together in a couple weeks or get together next week? Let me do some digging and see what I could find. And you'll go back and continue the conversation. Um, in Philipp, uh, Philemon 6, it says, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you'll have a full understanding of every good thing you have in Christ Jesus. People are going to ask questions. You're not going to know the answers to all the questions. When they ask questions, you don't have to be dissuaded by that. Say, that's a great question. I want to see if I can find out the answer. And you're going to grow because you're going to be digging and getting deeper in your faith. They may say some horrible things about what it is to be a Christian because they've been hurt by people. Stay intrigued there because you'll be able to engage in that level too. And I'll mention more to you about that. Um, have generic questions that you can ask whether it's a person you know well or whether it's a person you've just met. Where are you from? What's your name is a great one. Where are you from? I remember one time saying to a guy, um, where are you from? Have you always lived in Chicago? He said, no, I grew up in Albuquerque, but when my, my folks divorced when I was 12, I moved to Chicago with my mom. He didn't have to tell me his folks divorced. He could have just said, I grew up in Chicago, uh, Albuquerque and moved to Chicago. Even the information when he was 12 was significant. If he never told me about the divorce, if I'm listening, there's plenty there to go on. If I could have said, wow, you moved to Chicago when you were 12? From Albuquerque, you moved from perpetual heat to perpetual cold? You know, that would have been interesting just to talk and continue the conversation. But I could have said, you moved when you were 12? You had this base of subculture, of kids you knew from elementary school. You felt safe with them. And now, while you're on the threshold of adolescence and middle school, that purgatorial experience of life, <laughs> you moved to a place where you didn't know anybody? What was that like? And let the conversation go. And listen to the information they give. But he said when his folks divorced. And I was able to say, because he, if he gives you the information, or she gives you the information, they give you permission with that to ask more. And I wonder sometimes if stuff isn't percolating up because they want to deal with it. 
And we can see where Christ may already be tugging on their heart. So play on that. Listen to that. So I said, well, your folks were divorced. How was that for you? Don't make judgments. I remember saying that to one person who told me they were divorced, and they said, it was the best day of my life. If you knew what it was like to have lived in that house with my father, it was horrible. And so you don't, you, and then you, if they tell you that, say, wow, tell me about that. You're going to get to some place. And with this guy, it was that his dad was a deadbeat dad, never remembered his birthday, never remembered Christmas. And he was struggling with bitterness, and he didn't like what it was doing to him. He wanted to forgive his father because he saw that would be better for him, but he didn't know how to forgive, and he didn't feel he had the resources to forgive. That led naturally to the gospel. We don't take Jesus to anybody. He's already there. We just go and seek to make explicit what we discover he's already doing in the person's heart. Do you have siblings? Are you married? Any of these relational questions, you don't go there immediately. You go there slowly, but once those open up, you can't believe sometimes. Think, think in your own life, the biggest hurt you've ever had probably wasn't when you broke your arm in second grade when you fell out of the tree. Probably the biggest pain you've ever had in your life was a re relational brokenness. And my guess is the greatest joy you've ever had in your life wasn't that first time you went to Disneyland or Disney World. It's probably relational joys. And if you get to those places, play that out. Ask the person about them. Ask them about it as if you're a person who thinks deeply on these things. And I imagine you all have because you're liberally educated with a faith-integrated liberal arts education. And one of the greatest outcomes you can have from that is to be able to be engaged with the gospel with people Validate pain and anger and disappointment, bitterness and struggle. Don't shy away from these things. When people express that they're kind of angry, we want to say, whoop, don't go there. Now, I would suggest you go there. Go there. They brought it up. That means they want to process. You validate their pain. These may seem like barriers to faith. In fact, they may simply be the rubble of human brokenness which when dealt with and cleared away, open the route to a person's heart and lead to his or her willingness to accept the gospel with eagerness. I'll give you an example, a simple one. The hypocrisy question. I'm not interested in Christianity. There's too many hypocrites in the church. I've had that conversation hundreds and hundreds of times. I'm sure you have too. You know how I answer it? I just acknowledge that it's true. I say, you know, it's very perceptive of you. You know how I know it's true? They say, no, how? I say, I'm one. I'm one. I'm not proud of it, but I believe in the high ideal of love. But I've had sharp words with people I say I love most in the world. I believe in justice, but there have been times I've been unfair in my treatment of other people. I didn't set out to be unfair, but I realize in retrospect I had. No, I know there's hypocrites in the church. 100% of the time I've given that answer with only one exception, the people have responded and said, well, when you put it like that, I, I struggle too. It's interesting that the door that shut on the hypocrisy issue, when answered honestly, opened up the door to a hungry heart that wanted to know how to work through that stuff. Now we're two pilgrims on the same note, on the same road, sharing notes. What have you found helps you when you see those incongruities in your own heart? Usually they say, I, I don't have anything that helps me. And I say, you know what I'm starting to find really helps me to deal with it honestly? You know what? I've, I've, I'm coming to realize that God's love is not something that's conditional. It's ontological. God is love. His love is not improved by my well-doing, nor is it diminished by my poor doing. And I find that because of that, I can look honestly at these incongruities in my life and begin to work on them by His grace. Talk with them about forgiveness, and it opens the door wide up. Let me give you some other examples, though. I remember years ago, this best friend of mine, Tim, who I told you about, took me to the funeral. He had a, a foreign exchange student come and live with him from Germany. She lived that whole year. During the year, she came to faith midway through. Then at the end of the year, her folks were coming to pick her up from Germany. 
They had rented a motor home and they were going to travel America for a month before they flew back home to Germany. He was worried that when they found out their daughter had become a Christian, that they might be angry at him. So he said, we're going to go to dinner the night they arrived. Jerry, would you come to dinner with us? So we go to dinner and I'm sitting next to the father and I start talking to him. He was about my age. This was several years ago. And I said, you're from Germany. Where are you from? He said, Dresden. I don't know if you guys know, at the end of the war, Berlin was virtually surrounded. Dresden wasn't significant to the war effort. We said there were a bunch of ball bearing factories there. And Dresden was bombed, and they estimate anywhere from 30 to 70,000 civilians were killed right at the end of the war. It was unnecessary. And when this guy said Dresden, I know the story. When he said Dresden, I said, Dresden? He said, yeah. I said, has any American ever said to you, the bombing of Dresden was wrong, it was unnecessary? Would you forgive us for this? His eyes welled up with tears. And he said, I wish my father could hear you say this. I have no memory of him without his being angry about the bombing of Dresden. I said, is he still living? He said, yeah. I said, would you tell him for me? And he looked at me and he said, has any German ever said to you, the invasion of Poland that started World War II was wrong? Will you forgive us for this? And the whole discussion went down deep, rooted into deep matters of our humanity. And we talked about forgiveness, and we talked about grace, and we talked about human brokenness. We talked about bitterness that can arise if we react to things and we don't deal with them properly. At the end of the conversation, he was so glad his daughter had become a Christian while she was in America. Go there. Go to these places. Be a surrogate. I was down in Oklahoma City one time. I was doing a wedding down there of a Wheaton grad. Uh, he and his wife or fiance at that time invited me to go down there to do the wedding. And while I was there, I thought, you know what, I want to go see the memorial to the Muir Federal Building that was blown up. At the time, it was the biggest terrorist act in American history, and it was done by an American. And before 9-11, it, it, it was the deeply rooted, tear your heart out of your chest kind of thing. There was a, a nursery there where people were, were uh, uh, working in the building. They could leave their children in the nursery. So many of those babies were killed. I go down there to see this thing, and they've got this memorial. They've got this, this, this sheet of glass where the street was. Not glass, but water that looks like glass. They had this tree across the way that had all of the leaves blown off of it, and the tree looked like soot. It was darkened, and it came back. Across the street, there's a church that had lost all of its windows. And the pastor got up that Sunday morning as America watched the event on national television. And, and while we were watching the event of that service, that memorial service, the pastor said the first person that wept when this occurred was Jesus. And the church built a statue of Jesus with sheep around him, looking towards where the building was with tears flowing down his cheeks. Very moving. And then where the building was, they have chairs. Big chairs with the names of all the adults that were killed. And little tiny chairs with the names of every baby that was killed in that building. It's very moving. And I see these two black policemen. They always keep some policemen at the site. And I walked up to them and I said, were, were you men working that day? They said, yeah. One guy said I was 10 miles away. And I heard the blast like it was right next door. And the other officer said, I was a half a block away. And I was the first policeman on the site. And I heard the screams coming out of the building. And I ran into that nursery. And I'm pulling babies out, injured, wounded, some of them limp and already dead. And we just started talking about man's inhumanity to man. And I'm seeing these black officers who come from a history in our country of great, great sadness and oppression. And I said to them, 
You know, we can talk about man's inhumanity to man, but has any white guy ever said to you, he is so sorry for the oppression that your progenitors experienced at the hands of his progenitors. Will you forgive us for this? All of us were crying by that time. And they said, yeah, it just so happened these two men were both Christians. And we had some great discussion about the grace of God and the forgiveness of God and so on. Don't be afraid to be a surrogate. If somebody says, I don't want anything to do with Christianity. I've been so wounded by Christians. I've seen this, I've seen that, and so on. Just say to them, you know what? I'm impressed by your, your sensitivity to injustice. I think it's a good thing that you have an informed and developed heart about these matters. And because you do, I want to do something with you. I'm a Christian. And if you've been hurt by Christians, I want to stand as a surrogate before you and say what those Christians did was wrong. Will you forgive us? And I want to ask you for your forgiveness because I know this truth. The God of the universe loves you deeply. And he proved it in sending his son Jesus here to die for your sins. And I wouldn't want anything that anybody else ever did to keep you from seeing how great God's love is for you. Please forgive us so we can remove that distraction and you can begin to see the greatness and magnitude of God's love for you. I think we can do that. And I think it has merit and it has effect. Plato says in the laws, an abuse does not nullify a proper use. If you judge any segment of society by its worst examples, nobody could stand. And I think you can sometimes just talk to the person at that particular, uh, particular level. Um, I don't think that clock's working right, is it? That's right, okay. Um, so I don't want, I, it doesn't have to be eternal to be spiritual. So I know that that's true. Um, so the other thing is looking for an opening, you want to go deeper with people. Um, here's one for you. Uh, this is from Thomas Traherne, the uh, metaphysical poet. He was a contemporary of George Herbert and John Donne. And he wrote this in his Centuries of Devotion. The noble inclination whereby man thirsteth after riches and dominion, that is money and power, is his highest virtue. Would you have said that? If you saw somebody pursuing riches and power, would you say, wow, that desire that's caused you to search after riches and power is your highest virtue. I probably wouldn't have said that. I probably would say you shouldn't have those feelings. But Traherne says, don't tell a person they shouldn't have those feelings. Look at the whole quote. The noble inclination whereby man thirsteth after riches and dominion, that is money and power, is his highest virtue, when rightly guided and carries him as in a triumphant chariot to his sovereign happiness. Men are made miserable only by abusing it, taking a false way to satisfy it. They pursue the wind. He says, don't trash the desire. Ask the person if having tethered it to those particular pursuits, riches and power, if it's satisfying them. And if it isn't, ask them if the desire might be for something else. C.S. Lewis said, if I find in my heart a desire which nothing in this earth can satisfy, it doesn't mean the world is a crock. Maybe the world was meant to awaken the desire, but never to satisfy it, that we would go questing for it elsewhere. It's Augustine, our hearts are restless, O God, till they find their rest in Thee. Um, uh, we can, we can uh, go on further, um, but let me just say, um, nobody seeks for God, Paul said. So if you see a person who might be questing for God, you can bet that the Holy Spirit's been there before you got there. And don't be dismissive of the quest. Um, if you study theology and soteriology, regeneration always precedes um, repentance, confession, conversion. Regeneration is the prompting of the Holy Spirit to get a person to look rightly at the graces of God and so on. And so consequently, if we see a person who has spiritual hunger, what does that mean? And maybe we're going to make explicit what might be going on implicitly there. Some could be critical here, believing that an attempt to connect the gospel to human need is too anthropocentric. But in fact, if the need is genuine, then it, 
It is connecting the gospel to those features in one's humanity that God has set in place. It is working with the raw features embedded in what it means to be human. And in this way, it is theocentric, for it is working in cooperation with the way humans are created. And again, Augustine wrote, Thou hast made us for thyself, O God, and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in thee. Um, I've got uh, some stuff here, but I, I, I want to go through this quickly. I've got some stuff on other religions. We could talk about that if in the Q&A time you want to discuss that. But when you finally are asking questions and you get to the deep-seated needs, Evelyn Underhill talked about these three. They're not an exhaustive list. If there's three, there could be 3,003. But C.S. Lewis talks about the same three in another book. So I, I think that these needs are probably fairly common. Um, they talk about the pilgrim longing. Uh, that longing you feel this summer when you go home. And you go home and it's not the same. It's changed a little bit. But we go home. When you're my age and you go home for the school reunion, they give you a name tag with your yearbook picture on it because nobody would recognize you otherwise. And my friends, man, they're all bald. They're fat. They have gray beards and thick glasses. And life's been really hard on them. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm fine. But you go back, the old vacant lots where you played, a building's built on them. The buildings that were familiar have been knocked down. New buildings are in place. Um, the conversations don't go quite as smoothly as they did when you were more intimately connected. You've been away for a bit. They've been away. Things have changed. You go back to some people and they bring up some conversation that you don't even remember, but it's freeze-frozen in their mind. Or you bring it up because it's freeze-frozen in your mind about some event back then. There's been a lot of water under the bridge. You go back home and it's not the same. The Hobbit. Take your friends to see that one. The whole theme of The Hobbit is there and back again. Bilbo Baggins isn't made for traveling. Actually, he is made, but he doesn't travel because he's from the Shire. And they're homebodies. And he's, he ends up getting coerced into being the 14th member of a 13-member group of dwarves who are going back to reclaim their ancestral home from the dragon smog. And you can't have a quest with 13. It's an unlucky number. So they need a 14th member of their quest. And Gandalf the wizard just thinks Bilbo is perfectly suited for it. He doesn't need shoes. He's got leathery bottom feet that are better than shoes. And he ends up on this quest. And the first night, he has to sleep on the hard ground. He wishes he was back at his feather bed back home. First night, the provisions go bad and get stale. He longs for the fresh food in his larder back at his hobbit hole back home. First time they encounter danger with the trolls, Bert and William and Tom. Here's Tolkien. He gives his wizards names like Gandalf. He gives his dwarves names like Thor and Oakenshield and Gimli. He gives his elves names like Legolas and Gladriel. But he gives his trolls pedestrian names like Tom and William and Bert. Not that those are bad names, but we wouldn't expect them from Middle Earth. Why does he borrow from our world to give his bad creatures names? <laughs> But when he comes into danger, what does he do? He longs for his hobbit hole where it was relatively safe. The whole time through that book, 18 times he longs to go home. When he gets home, it's not the same. Sackville Baggins has declared him dead. They're stealing his stuff. He fights to get it back. Some of them say he's an imposter and they won't give it back. And Tolkien's saying it's not that home. What is it? What are we longing for and desirous of? So there's this home longing. Another longing is a relational longing. Have you ever felt lonely before? What does that tell you about your nature? You're a sociological being. The fact that you can communicate tells you you were made for community. Have you ever felt lonely, though, in a crowd? Or lonely living under the same roof with other people you know well and they know you? It doesn't prove anything, but might it not strongly suggest you were made for some relationship no mere human relationship ultimately can satisfy. And the other one is the longing to have what's in us that's broken, fixed. Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever find yourself? My, my oldest son, Jeremy, you know Jeremy, he works in your area. And Jeremy had been disobedient at home. He's about four. 
And all that day, he had been sort of ornery. And I said, Jeremy, you, you got to stop being like this. And he started crying. He says, I can't, Dad. I can't fix it. I can't fix it. And all of a sudden, I realized something spiritual is going on here. And I shared the gospel with him. And that was the morning Jeremy gave his heart to Jesus. All of us, though, have a sense of brokenness. We live beneath our own expectations for ourselves. And we can connect the gospel at that place as it percolates into the conversation. Um, it's Frederick Beekner who says, before the gospel could be good news, it's got to be bad news. C.S. Lewis says, you're going to always have to awaken in a person a sense of sin. But the best way to do it, he says, is not to point out the other person's sins. Just talk honestly about your own struggles. And he says, often that does the trick because it, it, there's some transparency, some authenticity, and it brings it to the level of deep felt need, and you can connect the gospel at that place. Often, the people will begin to let down their guard like you do. Um, anyway, those are places where you eventually want to get to. Again, it's not an exhaustive list. When 9-11 occurred, I found myself asking questions. Um, Todd Beamer used to come to my house for Bible study. Lisa Beamer and Todd used to be kids in my youth group. He was just getting on a plane to go do some business and he was going to fly back the next day or so. And the pillow he lifted his head from that morning, he never set his head back on. And I caught myself saying, how can we be safe? This guy was just going to do business. But why would we expect to be safe? Every one of us knows somebody who lifted their head from a pillow one morning and never let it rest on that pillow at the end of the day. What is it in us that longs for safety in a world that has not been able to offer that? Why do we have that expectation? Could that not itself also be a heaven longing? C.S. Lewis said, notice how we're perpetually surprised at time. Fancy John being grown up and married. Fancy me being a senior at Wheaton when I was a freshman yesterday. And in a couple days, I'm going to be walking across Edmund's stage. And where did it go so fast? Lewis basically says, why are we surprised at time? Do fish complain to the sea for being wet? Or if they did, would that fact not strongly suggest that they had not always been or would not always be purely aquatic creatures? He says, could it not be that we're surprised at time because basically we are eternal creatures and we will never be? completely satisfied with time. Or 9-11, another thing I thought to myself that day, what's this going to come to mean for us? We're still trying to figure that one out. But why do we want to make sense of our experience if there's no sense to be made? Isn't the longing to make sense of something, the longing to find purpose in something, that longing expressed in the book that all of you liberally educated, faith-integrated people have read Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, where he said after being in a Nazi concentration camp, if there's a meaning in life, there must be a meaning in suffering. And wanting to find sense out of things. That conversation can help you easily segue to the gospel. You can just say, you know, this is an interesting question. Be engaged with the question. Don't come across like you've got all the answers. I think we can have answers, but even the answers we have, those of you who have taken class from me know, every truth we know, right, can still be plugged, plumbed more deeply, applied more widely, and be seen in coherent relations with other truths. I believe in absolutes only conceptually. I don't know anything absolutely. Be honest about that. Say, you know, these longings are intriguing to me. I don't, I don't know that I have the last word on it, but I've found something that's pretty certain for me, and it's a sure word. And you begin to talk about how Christ has met you at the place of your deepest longing. And you have authenticity, and with that authenticity, authority, as you mention those things. And my guess is if it's percolated in a conversation that has developed slowly, the segue to the gospel will be natural and winsome. It's kind of cool, isn't it? You explain the gospel to them. It's not very complex. 
remember once I took a bunch of Wheaton students down to the Pacific Garden Rescue Mission. We did the service. One guy came with me. His name was Steve. He'd never led anybody to Jesus before in his life. I said, come with me to the rescue mission. I'm supposed to preach there tonight. There'll be guys coming forward. You'll easily be able to share Jesus because they're already coming, identifying that they want to accept Christ. So the men are coming forward, and I'm matching up people that came with us, and they're going into this discussion room to pray and so on. And, and Steve's here, and I say, Steve, oh, Steve, go with that guy. He says, what do I tell him? I said, well, go to your Bible and use the verses in your Bible that explain the gospel, explain it to him, ask him if he would like to uh, trust Christ, and then pray with him and begin to follow him up. He said, I didn't bring a Bible with me. I said, Steve, do you know John 3.16? He says, yeah. I said, go share that verse with him. Explain to him what it means. Not only what it means in the text, but what it's come to mean to you and what it's coming to mean more and more to you every day. Share it with vitality. And he went and led that guy to Jesus. And he's led a lot of people to Jesus since then. First time he ever did it. Is that cool or what? And just take them to the verses. But God proved his love for us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. Just explain it. And ask them if there's any reason why they wouldn't like to accept Christ right then. And if they say no, say, well, you know, let's keep the conversation going. If stuff comes up, um, Questions you have, let me know. I'll try and find the answers best I can. And keep talking with them and praying for them throughout the summer. And, and if they do accept Christ, then I always take them to John 6, 47 to follow them up. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I said, did you believe? Yes. What do you have? Well, eternal life. When does it begin? When I die. No. What does the scripture say? When I believe. And then I take them to John 17, 3, so they see it's not just some fire insurance or something, but it's a living relationship with the living God. John 17, 3, Jesus says, And this is eternal life, that they may know thee the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I said, it's not only forever and ever, but it's a relationship with the God who's wild about you, who made you and wanted you who made you so that you would chart the way you do on the Myers-Briggs, so that you'd look the way you do in the mirror. And he made you and delighted in you, and he didn't want duplicates of other people. He wanted you. It's relationship with him. And then I take him to Matthew 13, parable of the sower. And I say, which soil would you like to be? I've yet to have one say, I'd really like to shoot for the weedy one. I'd like to try and be the weedy soil. They always say, I want to be the fruitful one. I say, so do I. How about if we start getting together and let's just pray for each other and see if we can study the scriptures and see how we can grow. And we go through times of learning how to pray, learning how to get in the word, learning how to fellowship and how this Christian life wasn't made to be gone on alone. Learning how to give of ourselves, our time, our talent, our money, because God wants to cultivate in us magnanimity. He doesn't want us to have hoarding self-interest. And eventually I say, let's go share Jesus with people. We start praying for their friends. And we go share Jesus. You know, I've led thousands of people to Christ over the years. I've probably followed up seriously where we met regularly, maybe 250, 300 where we met one-on-one. -on -one. There's only one person I know of that 300 or so who once they got to the place where they were willing to share their faith is not walking with Jesus now. All the others are. When you get the person to the place where they're willing to care for those around them, to go and plant Christ's flag in the world where they live, to love on people and pray for them, that usually holds a person for the long haul, to the Jesus who loves them like that. So anyway, that's, that's a start, and here's some stuff, and I'm, my hope and prayer, I mean, I got some stuff on cultural questions and cultural issues in there from uh, Terry Eagleton's uh, stuff on postmodernism and also uh, 
from Charles Cochran's stuff on how the church grew in Rome and it grew in Rome. He says, not because of good Roman roads garrisoned well and common language. He says the biggest reason why it grew was the church could answer the questions the culture was asking, but the culture couldn't answer. And that's a really interesting book that, uh, um, uh, uh, Christianity, there's a dog on it. Hang on just a second. Uh, Cochran's book, Christianity and Classical Culture, A Study of Thought and Action from Augustus to Augustine. Um, it's a great book. Maybe you read it. it well, there's one prof here who's using that as a textbook. It's old. It was written in 1940, but it's pretty perceptive. Um, but anyway, maybe somebody has some questions. Yes, sir. I don't know. I just had a. Say question. your first name again. I'm Josh. Josh. Um, when I share like faith with my friends like back home, a lot of times like it ends up like an argument almost. Uh huh. And like I'm just like telling them like, oh, this is why the Bible is true. Like the only sources and all this, and Jesus really did rise from the dead. They're like, okay, that's great. That's information. But like, how do I get to the point where I can start sharing them what really matters, like the heart to heart issues mm -hmm. that you're talking about? How do I get to that point? Is just arguing with them, because I don't want to do that. Yeah, no, I, that's fair. Share out of your brokenness. Share out of the truth of your brokenness. Everything the Bible says about what it means to be human is true. We have great dignity. We're made in the image of God. And we are deeply broken. Brokenness connects. And, and after they come to Jesus, they may be as intrigued as all get out to hear, all the great stuff that you've learned that is great apologetic material. But the greatest apologetic is that the God of the universe knows us and loves us. And he's forgiven our every flaw. And he wants to heal us inside out. I would go there. If they have questions about that other stuff, feel free to answer them. But even when you answer them, Say, but you know what really holds me to this stuff? Even more than all that intellectual stuff, which is really intriguing to me and I love it. But what holds me is that understanding myself with all my brokenness, God loves me and he forgives me. And I find it compelling. It's cool, huh? Anything else? Yes, first name again? Megan. Megan. Forgive me. Um, what do you think about people who maybe go to church? Like, I, I have friends at home who maybe go to church, but don't really understand or have really been receptive of maybe what's being said there. It's more just like a family obligation or something yeah. like that. How, how do you address the, kind of the gospel with them? Yeah. The, the church thing is, is helpful on two levels. Um, at some level, they have at least a cultural connection with it. And I want to talk about then two kinds of people. The person who's gone for years and hasn't connected. And the person who's just visiting. Every Sunday at church, churches have people come through the doors who are not Christians and are looking for something. And if, if, if you assign seating charts in churches and made all the congregates sit in the same place every Sunday, they would rebel. But they all sit in the same place every Sunday anyway. <laughs> so teach them to be pastors of their pew or pastors of their section at the church. And anytime they see somebody they haven't met, go up to them and say, you know, I usually sit in the same section. Are you new here? Because I have never met you before. And they may say, no, I've been going here 30 years, but I've always sat up there, but my ears are getting bad, so I've moved a little closer or something like that. And then talk with them, and next week when you see them, call them by name, tell them you prayed for them that week, you know. But always look for the new person that you don't know. And I, I've had this conversation many, many times with people and have led people to Jesus after a worship service. And I remember one time a guy, is, I went up to him and I said, you, you look new to me. He says, I, I am new. I've never been here before. I said, what brought you here? He said, my girlfriend broke up with me this last week and I'm pretty beat up by it. And I thought, maybe at church I could find some answers. He could have walked in and walked out and nobody talked with him. And those people come every Sunday to most churches. And just say to them, you know, you came here, you were looking for something. 
Can I tell you what's at the heart of the gospel? What's at the heart of the Bible's message? God's vital message of love to us. And they'll say, yeah, because they came there looking. You share the gospel with them and say, is there any reason why you wouldn't like to trust Christ right now? And usually they'll say, yeah, and you lead them to Jesus and you start following them up. So there's that person. When 9-11 hit, they said the churches swelled in attendance greater than they even did during World War II. And they came and they left. A year later, there was a television program that was said, where was God on 9-11? As soon as it hit, everybody runs to church. And then in time, they left the church, and now they're asking, where was God on 9-11? Because the people in the church weren't ready to tell them about the love and grace of God and the hope in a broken world, so on. So that's one group of people. Another group of people are the people that have been going to church for years. And, and I don't like to make an us-them with them. Um, I have a neighbor lady across the street. I don't know if she knows Jesus yet. I don't know if her husband knows Jesus yet. They're Irish Catholics from Chicago. And he loves to put a chair out in front of his house and sit there. Like the old Catholic neighborhoods where they had the chair on the stoop and watch the neighbors walk by. And whenever I see them out there and I've got time on my hands, I always go over and sit with them and say, I love the Irish Catholic neighborhood cultural phenomenon of sitting out and watching. And we talk. And I talked to his wife. They go to St. Mike's over here. And, uh, and I always assume that we're on the same page. I'm not sure we are. But they're church people. And so I'm going to allow them the benefit of the doubt. In all our conversations, I talk about faith matters like, you know how we are, we people of faith. And then I get the gospel in. And I was talking to the neighbor lady across the street the other day. And I was able to share the whole plan of salvation twice in the conversation. She lit up each time, but she told me, you know, this is interesting to me because I feel in my heart there's some peace missing and I'm looking for the answer. And she shared that with me. That's cool. I can play on that next time I talk with her. You see, so always go alongside the person who's going there and say, you know, is this doing it for you? If they say, no, I, I come because my family comes. I say, what is it that's, why is it not working for you? What, what is it that you see missing? And let them unpackage. Maybe they've never talked about what seems to be missing. And now you let it percolate to the surface naturally, winsomely. And you can start helping them investigate this and help answer the questions and make the segue to the God of grace who loves them and forgives them in Christ. And that's how I would go. Is that fair? I don't think it's the only way, but it's a way. Yeah. Yeah, um, so one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about uh, lately is um, my uh, uncle has uh, alcohol difficulties. And he was constantly getting drunk and just uh, beat my aunt one or two times and just abused his kids and stuff like that. We've tried to put him in uh, like um, rehab. rehab and stuff like that. And, it, and it's been really hard for us to, to just approach the problem. And on one hand, we want to be like really forgiving and really represent Christ in that. But at the same time, like we have to, there has to be some sort of heavy hand in that he can't do it. And, like It's been really hard for me to reconcile or kind of decide which of the two approaches uh, to have it. Yeah. How would you look? Well, alcoholism is a complex topic, and you have to try and figure out from what quarter they're coming. Uh, for some people, drink is an anesthetizing behavior, and they use it to deaden some deep psychological or emotional pain. And until you can get to where that pain is that they're trying to deaden, you might have difficulty. And you're going to get there by letting them talk. So sometime when drink isn't part of it, start to ask them about their childhood. Just ask them questions. Hey, where did you grow up? How was it when you were a child? You might find out that his parents beat him. You might find out that there's some deep-rooted, I hate to use that word, deep-seated um, <laughs> uh, tragedy in his life that he's never been able to grieve or forgive. And if you can get him to talk about it, and all of a sudden you start to see some tears. 
Tears oftentimes are a place where the Holy Spirit reveals that He's at work. Whenever I see somebody in a conversation beginning to cry, I say, are those tears? And if they say, yeah, I say, our tears are always trying to speak to us at some level. Let them go. Go ahead and feel. Sometimes it's more than reason that blocks access to the heart. It's the deep emotion. And let the tears flow and let them talk. If they talk about being abused or beat up as a child, talk to them about the love of God. Talk to them about forgiveness. I had a bunch of friends in Santa Barbara, and they were at a retreat. They had asked me to come out and speak at their retreat. And at this retreat, there was one group that wanted to talk to me during the afternoon free time, you know. And they were a small group of guys at that church, all married, all had little kids and stuff. And they said one time they were talking in a group. How would we reach, they like to read apologetic books and all that stuff. How would we reach, and they said, I know a sharp uh, Ivy League professor of philosophy who's an atheist. They thought that would be the pinnacle, you know. Ivy League philosophy uh, professor who's an atheist. And the first guy said, well, I think I would go at it with a sort of cumulative argument for God's existence. The other one said, oh, I think I'd talk to him about the problem of evil. No, I would talk to him about how we know the Bible is really the word of God. Well, I would talk to him about how the church thought through the issues of the Trinity and the Incarnation and the two natures of Christ. And one guy finally said, you know what? I don't think Jesus would have done any of those things if he talked to that guy. I think he would have said to that guy, do you remember when you were eight years old and your dad said that cutting thing that hurt you so deeply? I would have never done that to you. I love you. And if you can get the person to the place where the hurt occurred and then begin to talk to them about the grace of God, but let them pour it out emotionally to press out the emotional pus of it rather than keep it suppressed so that they're not trying to heal the wound artificially and talk to them about the power of God to help them forgive so they could untether. Anne Lamott, you know, in her Traveling Mercies book said, bitterness is like you drinking the rat poison and waiting for the rat to die. You want to untether from that. But if it's, if it's not psychologically and emotionally driven uh, anesthetizing behavior, if it's that they've got the, the gene that gives them a, a propensity towards alcoholism, um, probably rehab will be necessary for that person. And they have to come to a conscious understanding that drink is not something they can, they can engage in. And they've got to refrain. And to try and discern which of these it might be, there's a couple of other complexities too. But I'd probably read a little bit on it. I'd try and engage with him. I'd try and love on him when he's sober so you develop trust with him so maybe he would feel you're one person he can, he can let down his guard with, you know. I'd go there. Um, anybody else? Yes, sir. Um, I was wondering if you had advice for um, evangelizing the people um, who got a lot more to lose. Um, when, they, um, they've got what? They've got a lot more to lose when accepting, like being like a stolen by their family or yeah. um, losing friends. Or, um, and like, more, like a Muslim or something like that? Yeah. Or somebody Jewish who might be shunned by their family? You know, a lot of those people, the point where the, the, the line is drawn in the sand is if they're baptized. So it seems to me you could lead them to Jesus and not bring them to that place until much later. As a matter of fact, in the ancient church, they didn't baptize people until after they were catechized. So they accepted faith, and then they were mentored, and then they finally came to the place of baptism. And I think if you could put off the baptism, because for, for some of these, for the Jews, that's the mark. If you're baptized, you've stepped over the line. I've even heard of it before with Muslims who have come to faith, and their families have said to them, but were you baptized yet? Because then they think that means you're serious. Well, build in them, disciple them, get them deeply rooted in the faith. And then, and then if, if your tradition is one where they have water baptism, then you can move in that route. But I would first ground them in faith um, and love on them and make sure that while they're being nurtured in faith, they're developing a subculture of support so that if, in fact, their family does reject them, they've got a place to fall where they feel they have a new family. 
family of God. Uh, my, my Hebrew professor when I was in seminary, Charles Feinberg, he was like Adler, he was one of the three geniuses I've met. I think the three geniuses I know are uh, Walter Elwell, he used to teach theology here, Mortimer Adler, and this Charles Feinberg, and maybe Robert Bishop, the physics prof here. I mean, that guy is something else, my word. And I know a lot of smart people and a lot of clever people, but Feinberg had his PhD at age 21. He was fluent in 16 languages. Not had a working knowledge, he was fluent. He was a remarkable guy. Photographic memory, I could tell you stories about him. How did a guy that bright become a Christian? They had a Sabbath Gentile in their home. Because on the Sabbath, you can't heat water. You can reheat it, but you can't heat it. You have to have heated it the day before. And they were Orthodox Jews. And so they had the Sabbath Gentile come in to start the fire so they could reheat the water they had boiled the day before. I mean, some of the legalism, it's crazy. And this woman who is a Sabbath Gentile, she was basically a cleaning lady in their house. She kept loving on him and praying for him and talking to him. And he had questions she couldn't answer. And she said, I think I know somebody who could answer them. And she took them to a man she knew, John Solomon, who was a converted uh, Jew. And he led Dr. Feinberg to Jesus. And Dr. Feinberg's father denounced him. And Feinberg told me, I saw my father two times after that, only two. My mother told me one day where he would be walking by. And I went and stood back just so I could see him. And he felt the great loss of it. And sometimes that's going to happen, and I think all of us, if we make a decision for Jesus, there may come times when it will cost us. But it will only cost us temporarily. Jesus says, if you're not afraid of me before men, I'll not be afraid of you. I'll not deny you before my Father. But I would, I would not have a new believer make that kind of stand that early in their life. They're just too early in the faith. And I would try and nurture them and love them and give them this base of support. Feinberg fell in a base of support. It was a collective of uh, Jewish believers who nurtured him and loved on him. But it was a cleaning lady that got through to him. That's cool, isn't it? I hope that's helpful a little bit. There'll be struggles, but just love on them and so on. Anybody else? We've got time for one more question. I thought I saw a hand up over here. Oh, there you go. Um. How would you respond to a person who's hesitant to give it all to Christ because they feel like it's just a completely emotional decision based on feelings and they don't want to put like, their eggs in one basket without food yeah. like, or something? Somebody who says it's uh, emotional, they don't want to put all their eggs in one basket without substantive proof. Um, I, I would probably say, I mean, I want to know more about this, first off, but I would say, you know, you're right, it is emotional at some level because it's fully human, and therefore it's something that can fire on all cylinders. And if you have some serious intellectual questions, so it's the opposite of, of uh, the thing you asked just a moment ago, you know, do I give them the reasons, and do I give them this, and do I give them that? This person might need those reasons. So you go introduce them here to, first name again? Josh. You give, introduce them to Josh, he's ready to help in that situation. <laughs> I'm serious, if all our eyes, where would the hearing be? We want to depend on each other and utilize the gifts of one another. And say, I, I'll try and find those answers for you and so on. But say, it, it does have an emotional component. When you come to faith, it's going to connect with all of you, not just part of you. But if it's the reason part that's holding you up, let me see what I can do to find answers for you. And I would engage them. Uh, George MacDonald made this assessment. We do not have souls. We are souls. We have bodies. If you tell a child he has a soul, he thinks like anything he has, his books, his, uh, his keys, his coat, he could leave it behind someplace and he goes on. He thinks when he dies, he goes to the grave and his soul goes off to heaven. McDonald said, no, tell a child he is a soul and he has a body. He's not a Gnostic. He has a body and when he dies, he goes to heaven and he leaves his body behind like clipped hair on the barbershop floor, for those of you that still go to barbershops and stuff like that. Um, so I don't know exactly what makes up the soul, but traditionally we've said this immaterial part of us has a thinking part, the reason. 
It has a feeling part, the emotion, and it has a choosing part, the volition. I want to suggest to you the reason is by far the weakest part. Because my reason, being weak, can be marshaled by the emotion and the will to make all kinds of uh, um, concessions. If I make a bad choice, my reason doesn't kick in and say, boy, Jerry, that's just stupid. You follow down that line, you're going to hurt yourself and you're going to hurt others. No, my reason, being weak, is marshaled by my will to make all kinds of rationalizations and justifications of that bad choice. In philosophy, it's called acrasia or acrasia, where we rationalize bad acts. Uh, C.S. Lewis said, continued disobedience to conscience makes conscience blind. Or Paul said, we suppress the truth in our unrighteousness. Or Aristotle in the Nicomachean Ethics said, vice is unconscious of itself. Eventually we do the bad so much and we rationalize it so much, we become hard-hearted. Um, then if my emotion, if I'm hurt and wounded deeply, my reason often doesn't kick in and say, boy, Jerry, you need to grieve that event. Press out the pus of it emotionally and forgive the person who hurt you so you can untether from that event. Otherwise, your whole life will be defined by your bitterness. No, my reason being weak is marshaled by my emotion to keep that, that hurt encapsulated and assist on my soul. You bump up against me, I'm going to bleed some pus in your direction and somebody else's direction, and I'm going to just live this reactive, bitter life. Maybe I'm going to go to drink because I'm reacting to it, and that's the way I'm resolving or deadening the pain temporarily. So, say, this whole Christian faith is, is a whole human deal. We respond to it holistically. We, we, it might be, you know, like pistons, a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here. As we grow, we respond more and more. But say, it's not just emotional, but it is emotional. It's not just rational, but it is rational. It's not just volitional, but it is volitional. It's human. It's a human response of the creature to the Creator who loves us so deeply. Is that helpful? And we'll end there. Let's pray. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Um, First name? Judd. Judd. Um, I, I lack this uh, zeal. I, I lack this urgency in evangelism. And, uh, and I'm, I'm thinking uh, maybe a lot of it is that, you know, today we think uh, it's a better way to live if you accept Christ. But what about the, the warning of God's judgment that may be coming and scripture talks about you know if if you're quiet then his blood is on your hands but if you warn him then you're free from it yeah i i get nervous about that yeah because it it's too um humanistic in an approach to evangelism because it's too man-centered i remember as a boy growing up in a church that taught us if uh, we did a bad thing jesus wouldn't take us into heaven if we lived a holy and righteous life our last second We'd go straight to hell and all that stuff. Well, and we were the blood on your hands, how about just the warning? Well, well, we were told that we needed to share Jesus with people, and if we didn't, their blood would be on our hands. And the people would tell us, I don't want to be standing there on Judgment Day and have this person go marching off to hell, pointing their finger at me, saying, you, you're the reason. If you would have told me, I would have gone to heaven, but no, you were the one. You know, this sort of thing. And we're sitting there going like this, oh, my word, my word. It doesn't work like that. It works more like this. When I was in college, you have to again take this by faith, I played football. And I, and I started for three years on my football team. And I loved playing. And the coach had a game plan. And with that game plan, I got to be a part of it. But if I didn't play according to the game plan, he could have pulled me off the field and put somebody else in the game. It doesn't work that God's plan is totally dependent upon my faithfulness or lack of faithfulness. God's plan will be done. And the issue is, do I get to play in the game or am I going to be on the sideline? And it's something that's joyful, not something that's burdensome. And I believe there's a judgment to come. It hasn't come yet. And the people that I've loved on for some time, there's one woman I prayed for her for 25 years every day and eventually got to lead her to Jesus. And now she's teaching Bible studies. Was it worth the 25 years? I might have turned her off if I would have gone too fast. Another guy, it was about, uh, about 14 months that he came to Jesus, and there have been people on planes that happened right then. I'm open for all of it. I believe the judgment is coming. 
That's not why I share Jesus. I share Jesus because the God of the universe loves us. And I want everybody to know. Like with the cure to cancer. If I had it, I wouldn't leave a hospital uh, unvisited. I'd go to them all. And I have the cure to the deepest aches of the human soul. The God of the universe knows us, loves us, and forgives us of our sins. And I want them to know him. And, and I believe God's in charge. And I believe he knows what he's about. And if I don't do the job, Jesus said that the, the, if these people were quiet, the stones would cry out. And I know he preached a really effective sermon through Balaam's donkey. So he doesn't need me. I want to be a part of it. And I'm going to be as faithful as I can in every process I can until the day I either go home to heaven or Jesus comes home. So I believe the judgment, but I don't believe that that's the way you get people motivated to share their faith. I believe you get them to fall so deeply in love with Jesus they can hardly talk about anything else. Is that fair? Okay, let's pray. Gracious Lord, I pray for every person who's here this evening that each one would have the privilege of leading somebody to Jesus this summer. Loving on them, praying for them, um, engaging in conversation, um, not being afraid to ask, is there anything that would keep you from trusting Christ right now? Following them up, maybe even leading somebody to Jesus early in the summer and going with that person to lead other people to Jesus. I pray that everyone would have the joy of letting others know how deeply they are loved by you and forgiven. And I thank you for this. Be with us now and bless us as we go our way. Fill us with your Holy Spirit in such a way that, as Jesus said, when my Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses. And I thank you for this, for Christ's sake. Amen. Bless you guys. Bless you. Have a great summer. <laughs>